for some 20 years straight, a major player in world politics has been struggling to avert a crisis. But it's not some pariah state, some North Korea or Sudan of the world teetering on the edge of total collapse, nor is it a world leading nation like the US or Russia, which is attempting to avoid some major loss of face. Instead, the nation in question is South Africa, a dominant force in sub-Saharan Africa whose success or failure is going to have major implications for many of the surrounding nations. South Africa's predicament has its roots in energy. But over the past few months, the situation there has devolved so far so fast that it's got many international onlookers wondering whether the worst might be about to happen. Between hospitals that can't trust their own lights to stay on, to rising crime, to financial instability and corruption that appears basically impossible to root out, South Africa is starting to look a lot less like a regional powerhouse and a lot more like a time bomb. So in today's special episode of War of Graphics, we're going to be digging into the crisis in South Africa, exploring how the nation's plight could shift the balance of geopolitical power and influence, and we're going to try and figure out what it would look like if South Africa's worst-case scenarios really did start to play out. Now, South Africa is a nation still trying to find its footing. After the upheaval and social reformations of the post-apartheid era, the nation has settled somewhat into a strong regional player among the most important countries of the Southern Hemisphere. But its rapid economic growth, its rapid industrialization, its political restructuring, and its complex place in the global geopolitical balance has left South Africa racing to play catch up with its own forward advancement. Put simply, it's all well and good to enjoy a swelling economy or live through positive societal change, but when every sphere and sector are growing at once, disparities in how fast each sector grows is going to leave room for one inescapable influence. Corruption. You see, in South Africa, energy has always been a complex issue. At the end of apartheid, the country found itself in a relatively advantageous position on the energy front. Bearing the weight of sanctions and forced isolation, South Africa's apartheid regime had pursued a policy of strict, nearly obsessive self-sufficiency, an initiative that built more than enough coal-fired power plants to keep the lights on. When apartheid ended, South Africa had more than enough electricity to electrify 2.5 million households that had previously gone without, with the vast majority of those homes being lived in by black families. So great was the energy surplus that South Africa even began to export its electricity to nearby nations. But even early in South Africa's post-apartheid years, the country knew that it would have an energy crisis on its hands before long. In South Africa, energy utilities are managed by a company called ESCOM, which is owned and operated by the South African government directly, and as early as 1998, just a few short years after the end of the apartheid regime, ESCOM had figured out that it was on track to run out of electrical reserves by the year 2007 unless something changed. Escon's older power plants were going to need to be phased out. Many of them were unreliable, and the government at the time was unwilling to invest in the sorts of building operations that would increase Escom's nationwide capacity. Now, there was, at that time, some talk of taking Escom into the private sector, so the government opted against taking action for years until it was too late for Escom to get in front of the crisis before it happened. In the years since 2007, there's one word that has become synonymous with South Africa's energy management systems. Load shedding. This is a practice of intentionally engineering rolling blackouts to rotating parts of a city, region, or country in order to lighten the load on the power system and prevent the entire thing from collapsing. With demands for electricity in South Africa still rising as more homes come onto the grids but barely any meaningful supply increase since 1996, rolling blackouts have become an absolutely necessary step to keep South Africa's lights on at all. Add to that the fact that most of South Africa's power plants are now aging badly and need constant maintenance means that if a plant breaks down or needs to come offline for some reason, the need for load shedding only gets worse. For well over a decade now, this very public issue has made ESCOM and South Africa's energy infrastructure into a lightning rod, not just for public criticism, but for use in furthering the goals of a wide range of players within South Africa. If a politician wants to score some easy points, they can dunk on ESCOM. If labor unions at ESCOM's power plants want to strike, they can leverage their ability to disrupt the nation's power supply. And if violent actors, saboteurs, or terrorists want to hit the government where it really hurts, they're going for the power plants. 
ESCOM's coal supplies have been severely depleted. The country has been slow to transition to wind and solar, and even when wind or solar is produced, it's just not consistent enough to allow ESCOM to interrupt the regularly scheduled load shedding that it has to do anyway. Now, Today, in the early 2020s, the problem is only getting worse. Some South African households experience nearly half a day without electricity on average, and the country's once booming industrial sector has been forced to cut costs, cut corners, and deal with the expectation that blackouts are all but unavoidable. South Africa has continually had to ramp up the severity and the extent of its countermeasures against the drain on electricity to the point that well over a third of the country's electrical grid may go without power for part of a given day. After a series of breakdowns in over half a dozen power stations forced load shedding to be reinstituted during the COVID-19 pandemic, things have simply never gone back to normal, and strikes, environmental catastrophes, fires, and more and more frequent breakdowns have escalated the situation even further. In 2022, South Africans dealt with load shedding measures for over 200 days out of the year, and 2023 so far has made 2022 look a bit like child's play. Now. As bad as South Africa's situation probably sounds already, we've got to make it clear that the nation's energy crisis does not exist in a vacuum. Instead, South Africa's rolling blackouts are either a symptom or a cause of a wide range of other issues facing the country, issues that seem to get worse and worse as the blackouts continue. Now, first, there's a problem that both bears the blame for the crisis in the first place and has meaningfully accelerated the rate at which things have gotten worse. And that is corruption. Something that South Africa has had rampant problems with from its apartheid days to the immediate aftermath till today. South Africa has robust laws in place that are supposed to deal with corruption in all spheres. But enforcement of those laws has been lax for decades, a problem that got even worse under the tenure of President Jacob Zuma, who led South Africa from 2009 to 2018. Perhaps not so coincidentally, those were years that the energy crisis could have been dealt with, but just wasn't. The ESCOM utility has had its own fair share of corruption, with a long list of scandals beginning in 2008 and accelerating significantly in the years of the COVID-19 pandemic and afterward. In some cases, this is as simple as ESCOM employees taking bribes to sabotage their own facilities or open the gates so that diesel oil thieves can sneak in and make a heist. In other cases, officials have routinely lied or obscured the low quality of coal used in plants while outside actors, particularly repair companies, have arranged for parts of power plants to be stolen so that they can be called to fix the problem. ESCOM's own former CEO, a man named Andre de Ruta, has alleged that the company is deeply infiltrated by chemical syndicates with high-level officials directly involved and that corruption siphons away the equivalent of over 50 million US dollars from ESCOM annually. And the two power plants that have been brought online since the start of the energy crisis, called Madupi and Kusile, are believed to have been rife with their own corruption during the construction process. Further, acts of sabotage take place with a shocking frequency, with everything from steel supports to cables to fuel supplies to coal-moving infrastructure taken out of commission in exchange for a quick buck. And of course, every time saboteurs bring a power station offline, the load-shedding problem only gets worse. And then there's the effect of frequent but unpredictable power cuts on those who are most vulnerable, and in particular those desperately in need of treatment at South Africa's hospitals. Even without the power supply to worry about, South Africa's public healthcare system is badly underfunded, it's badly understaffed, and it employs doctors and nurses who are badly overworked. And they are dealing with all of this while being forced to deal with shortages of critical equipment and medicine. Private hospitals and university hospitals are much, much better, but unaffordable for most of the population. Add in the energy crisis, and now these hospitals are sometimes forced to endure over 100 hours per month without power, forced either to rely on expensive emergency generators, or just take the risk that people will die who are attached to essential equipment like ventilators when the electricity goes out. Patients in operating theatres are at exceptionally high risk, as are infants in neonatal intensive care units, and many vaccines and medicines that must be refrigerated are useless by the time the power returns. 
When it comes to South Africa's food sector, the situation's no better. Power cuts wreak havoc across the nation's food infrastructure, from meat to dairy products that spoil en masse with a lack of refrigeration, to the large-scale die-offs of livestock raised in enclosed factories due to heat and a lack of ventilation. With availability of food so tightly restricted, prices skyrocket, taking much of the nation's regular diet out of the reach of its ordinary citizens. And the same goes for produce. It wilts and it rots before it can ever grace a dinner plate, and staple ingredients that should otherwise be able to last for months in people's refrigerators are just wasted. In the last few months, even South Africa's taps have started to run dry with not enough electricity throughout the day for functions even so essential as pumping water into homes and businesses. Add to that the power cuts' impact on sewage treatment plants' ability to clean wastewater, and soon there may be no guarantees that even the water that does reach somebody's home is safe to drink. And then there's the South African economy, where unemployment has reached staggering highs of 33% nationwide. That figure is so high for a wide range of reasons, but among them is the simple fact that many businesses in South Africa or any other nation will need a stable energy supply in order to remain at work. Small businesses who depend on power to operate are left hung out to dry whenever load shedding impacts their districts, often making large parts of the business day functionally useless while ensuring that any moments in which the power is on is a mad dash toward whatever productivity they can manage. Many companies have stopped hiring in anticipation of worse pain to come, meaning that young South Africans are more and more frequently entering a workforce that just has no place for them. On a larger scale, South Africa's central bank estimated that the nation's load-shedding policy would inflict costs of $13 billion on the country's economy, and the country's GDP growth continues to fall towards zero. And finally, we just have to talk about crime. In regard to break-ins, burglaries, larceny, looting, power outages present a prime opportunity for criminals to do their work unopposed, with electric fences, alarm systems, and street and indoor lights all inoperable. Now, the country's crime rates were already high prior to the recent load-shedding increases, and they've now gone through the roof, while the police are less able to respond to homes and businesses seeking help. And that's not just because of communication interruptions, either. With traffic lights rendered inoperable, police have to fight their way through badly congested streets in order to get anywhere. Political violence is also on the rise as protesters and discontented civilians begin to feel more emboldened to take drastic measures in order to make their voices heard. Some of South Africa's biggest cities have witnessed protests turn to violence and then to riots. So, when trying to figure out just what all of this means for South Africa, there is one clear and uncomfortable reality to start with. South Africa is rolling into election season. These elections, held in 2024, will contest all 400 seats of the South African National Assembly, where the African National Congress, the ANC, led by South African President Cyril Ramaphosa, has held a controlling influence for the vast majority of the country's post-apartheid history. But. In 2021's municipal elections, the ANC suffered a warning shot across the bow, with the party receiving fewer votes than ever and suffering a significant ongoing hit to approval ratings. Now look, it would be premature to declare that the ANC is on its last legs. The party still has a good chance to receive a plurality or even a majority of votes in the 2024 elections. But with the nation's many opposition parties conspiring more closely than ever to form a coalition, there's also a fair chance that the ANC, even with help from other parties, will have trouble getting the majority it needs to govern. Perhaps the worst possible outcome is one that would take a page from the aftermath of the US 2020 presidential election or the 2023 riots that took place in Brazil after President Jair Bolsonaro was voted out of office. Under such pressure from the blackouts and from the many, many issues that follow on from them, it's not inconceivable that a close or conspiracy-fueled election cycle could be the spark to set off the entire powder keg. Luckily for South Africa, the nation was able to weather its difficult winter season without a complete collapse this year. Reminder to our Northern Hemisphere viewers that May, June, July, and August are the coldest months of the year, not the warmest there. But just because South Africa survived this year doesn't mean that it's going to have an easy time next time around. And with the date for the 2024 elections not yet set as of the making of this video, there's a real threat that continued deterioration in the country will produce an even worse winter right before or even during the election season. And then 
There's the international side of the issue, where South Africa's predicament has wide-reaching ramifications both for the country itself and the entirety of sub-Saharan Africa. Of course, the nations that rely on South Africa for their own electricity, including Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Eswatini, and others, suffer chronic power cuts and shortages as well. And we don't want to undersell the serious impact of those measures on those nations, even if the political problems that come from them are somewhat further removed from South African politics. But potentially, the much larger issue in a geopolitical sense is how South Africa's energy crisis can be used as leverage by power players in the global community. And it's here that we mentioned China. China is the nation that appears most interested in being South Africa's lifeline. On August the 23rd of this year, South Africa signed a massive infrastructure overhaul agreement with China as part of the country's BRICS summit, also attended by India, Russia, and Brazil. The deal would not only upgrade the nation's transmission and distribution systems, but bring much-needed expertise in renewable energy plant construction and extend the life of the nation's existing coal-fired plants. Add to that a series of grants and emergency power sources, and China's resources, which South Africa has now accepted, well, it's the sort of offer that a country in South Africa's position just can't refuse. The package of deals comes alongside a long-standing initiative from China to expand its influence throughout Africa, leveraging diplomatic ties, deepening trade relations, and sponsoring large-scale infrastructure projects as a form of soft power, bringing these countries under China's influence without having to take any hostile action. China and South Africa in particular, maintain a booming trade relationship, with China investing more into South Africa than almost anywhere else in the world, even before this new aid package was signed. This sharply contrasts what South Africa has encountered from the US and Europe, who've been willing to supply funds in the name of moving South Africa toward renewable energy, but have been far more conditional in their support than China has. With South Africa strongly incentivized to take the most utilitarian solution as soon as it appears simply to stop the bleeding, the global West simply cannot compete with China's willingness to provide help immediately. Now, when trying to put our finger on what might come next for South Africa, it seems, at least from the outside, as if things could go in a few different ways. There's the version where South Africa gets itself together, either because of the actions of its federal government or in spite of them. There's the option where the nation relies on foreign partners to get through its lean years. And there's the worst case scenario where this situation, already close to untenable, just continues to get worse. In the coming years, South Africa has pledged to phase out 12 gigawatts of coal power and replace it with 18 gigawatts produced by renewable sources. But even in this best-case scenario, this is a process that takes more time than the people of South Africa may have. It's an open question how many more grueling years of shortage the country can endure, especially given the effects of the shortage are getting worse each and every year. But there's also another dimension that we have to consider here, which is that at present, the creation of any new power plants of any kind are probably going to be done through ESCOM. With the utilities track record so far, especially with its more recent plants, there's no indication that South Africans should expect anything other than an excruciatingly painful building process and one that the country's elite will most likely use to enrich themselves yet again. South Africa's current president, Cyril Ramaphosa, has emphasized his administration's desire to focus on the repair of the country's current coal plants and push off the dates at which others are expected to shut it completely. So too has he declared a state of emergency to provide more unilateral authority in dealing with ESCOM. Indeed, he's mobilized the military to keep South Africa's energy infrastructure safe, and he's created a position in his cabinet for an electricity minister. The administration has also opened the floodgates to private energy development, stressing the importance of renewable energy in particular and Ramaphosa has thrown his personal support behind a breakup of ESCOM. But in the grand scheme, a fair number of these initiatives have either failed to get off the ground or been ineffective once they did, while others are going to take years to implement, and still others are just a temporary stopgap that may not last long enough to fill the void. In some ways, it's difficult to blame Ramaphosa himself. His administration, after all, has inherited a long legacy of corruption and infrastructural inadequacy. But then again, they inherited it from the prior administration, where Ramaphosa himself was deputy president. With few answers coming from the federal government, some cities and municipalities within South Africa are beginning to explore other options. For example, the city of Cape Town has set a goal to go load shedding free within the next several years, with the help of a planned solar plant that should provide up to 60 megawatts of renewable energy. 
Not only would this reduce Cape Town's susceptibility to blackouts, but it would have at least some effect in reducing reliance on the ESCOM utility. The issue is whether such a change could ever be reproduced at scale, with South Africa still economically reliant on the same coal industry that's slowly killing it. And then there's the implication of South Africa's decision to strengthen its ties with China. As we mentioned, both South Africa and China, along with Russia, India, and Brazil, form a trade bloc called BRICS. And it's possible that South Africa's next step might be to lean more heavily on the entire BRICS squad rather than just China. South Africa and Russia already have a complicated relationship with South Africa unwilling to condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and Russian oil providers, particularly Gazprom, all too eager to get their hands on a new customer to make up for lost revenues due to Western sanctions. As we've seen play out again and again around the world, tighter links between Russia, China, and a third nation tend to have some very real trade and political impacts on that third nation, something that South Africa would likely need to weather as well. And lastly, there's the outside possibility, the option that all of this plays out in its worst possible fashion. If the South African power grid cannot be rehabilitated in time, if the intervention from China doesn't come quickly enough or isn't comprehensive enough, it's possible that ESCOM would be caught unprepared in the event of a major catastrophe. From natural disaster to sabotage to multiple co-occurring technological failures, there are a number of ways that South Africa's grid could be pushed beyond the brink. And if that were to happen, then the ensuing collapse could get very ugly very, very quickly. Take as a comparison the country of Venezuela, whose 2019 economic collapse was immediately precipitated by an energy crisis. Unlike South Africa, Venezuela relied on oil rather than coal, but after oil prices tumbled in 2014, Venezuela, like South Africa, spent years trying to prop itself up rather than collapse completely. A free-falling economy directly led to lower oil output, sending the economy down harder, lowering oil output even more. When that crisis was combined with an unfair, undemocratic 2018 election cycle, the situation became too much to bear, and since then, Venezuela has been in complete collapse. In South Africa, a country with, as we said, pre-existing high crime rates and endemic corruption, a similar collapse could have dire consequences. First, the nation would likely face weeks of continuous power outage, during which time looting and public unrest would almost certainly rise to unprecedented levels. At that same time, the South African government may choose repressive means to keep order rather than collaborative ones, especially in the event of either the African National Congress or an opposition coalition getting a shaky or even illegitimate hold on power. The country's water supply and sanitation, already highly questionable, would likely go down the tubes, and as emergency generators run out of fuel, hospitals, morgues, and food stores are likely to suffer catastrophic failure. South Africa's telecommunication systems, just as reliant as anything on ESCOM's power supply, would likely become inoperable, and according to ESCOM's own estimates, their power grid could take as long as two weeks to restore. What that means, and how it would be dealt with, we can't say, but we've really got to stress that those immediate effects aren't just hypothetical. At present, South Africa's energy situation is such that the only reason why water and food haven't become unavailable, why civil unrest hasn't taken over, and why hospitals can keep the lights on are the limited infusions of electricity that ESCOM can supply. Take those away, and South Africa will descend into chaos. Perhaps that chaos is temporary, and power, then centralized authority, is restored in short order. Perhaps it would necessitate boots on the ground from China, from the surrounding nations, or even from the West to lock down the pandemonium. Or perhaps it leads to civil war in a relatively well-off nation that nonetheless remains deeply divided across society. No matter the eventual outcome, it's clear to see that South Africa is in dire straits, not necessarily doomed for an impending collapse, but not particularly far off from it either. The future of the nation is being decided as we speak by ESCOM, by those in South Africa and around the world who continue to search for alternatives, and by those South African citizens who soon have to choose who, if anybody, is best suited to lead their nation away from ruin. For our part, we certainly hope that the crisis comes to a resolution soon, and one that leaves both South Africa and the millions of people who live there looking toward a brighter future than what seems to exist today.